Welcome, everybody, to Grace Community Church Wednesday night service. Uh, thank you all for coming out in person if you're here, and thank you for tuning in if you're watching online. If this is your first time watching, we'd just like to welcome you. And uh, my name is Wade, and we're glad you're watching. And I'm glad you're here if you're here in person. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, and we'll just get right into tonight's message. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to get up here and, and share what you put on my heart. God, just like Josh said a minute ago, I pray that you'd open, open our hearts and minds, Lord, to receive what it is you have for us tonight. And I just pray that you'll help us to actually apply these things to our lives so we can bear the fruit, Lord, that I know you want us to bear. And we'll give you the glory for that. And it's in Jesus' holy name I do pray. Amen. Boy, that glare from the door is amazing. All right. Well, uh, last week we talked about putting our faith into action and actually living out our faith and not just talking about it. You know, being actually being doers of the Word, like it says in James, and not just hearers of the Word. Uh, most of what we talked about last week related to other people, you know, how our faith uh, affects other people. You know, how we are, we talked about how we are God's hands and feet, and when God lays somebody on our hearts or somebody is hurting and we notice it or going through a hard time, we should be willing to actually help them if we can. You know, one of the verses that we read last week was James chapter 2 and verse 16, and that's what it's talking about. And it says, And one of you say unto them, talking about somebody in need, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? You know, if we just tell people, Oh man, that's rough, you know, I'll be praying for you, but we don't do anything to help them, you know, God's word says, it don't profit anything for them, for us, or for the kingdom of God. You know, we talked last week, too, that most of the time, God answers prayers through his people. You know, you are the answer to somebody's prayer. But that requires action. It don't, you know, it takes more than just noticing the need and talking about it. We actually have to put our faith into action and do something. That requires obedience to the Holy Spirit when he's nudging you to do something and I think the Holy Spirit is nudging all of us you know a lot of times and uh, sometimes we just brush it off and act like we didn't hear that because we don't want to deal with it and that's what we talked about last week actually putting our faith into action so we can be the hands and feet that we need to be to help people for God uh, you know and that requires having love and compassion for other people and not just being so self-absorbed that we're not concerned about anybody else. We talked about that last week, too. And uh, one of the verses that we looked at was uh, the 22nd verse in Jude. It says, And some having compassion, making a difference. You know, it's not, it's not enough just to see somebody's need and notice that they need help. If we have compassion for that person and the love of God is in us, we will do something and make a difference. Uh, we also shared this verse out of Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 you know we have to truly care about other people and that's what this verse says it says don't just pretend to love others really love them you know hate what is wrong and uh, I believe what that means is when we see what they're going through we need to take that personally and you know how would I feel if I was going through that and you know, what kind of help would I need if I was going through that and be willing to give them what we would need ourselves if we were in that same situation and hold tightly to what is good, it says. That means put our face into action and actually do something to help the other person. We've got to get out of our comfort zone to help them. And tonight, uh, tonight's message is not really far off from that. It's still talking about action, but it's a different kind of action. Uh, you know, last week we talked about how our faith in action is helping other people, and tonight I want to talk about our faith and how it affects us, uh, putting our own faith in action. So tonight I'm going to be talking about spiritual complacency. And uh, if you don't know what complacency means, uh, I brought a definition with me. I actually got five definitions of complacency, and we're going to talk about all five of them. 
But uh, I want to go through through each definition with God's Word and how it affects us and take a, a good look at those. Uh, if you were here last week, you know that the theme for our youth conference was Get Real. That was the theme for the youth conference, and that's, that's spilled over into our recovery ministries. It's, it's spilled over into just about, you know, every ministry we have. You know, it's time to stop playing church. It's time to start being the church, to actually start living out our faith like we talked about last week. And uh, the verse for the conference was First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. You know that? There's nothing complacent about that. You know, it, that means Jesus is coming. So be sober. Watch unto prayer. Be ready for that. So we do need to get real. But what I'm talking about tonight is we need to get ready. You know, Jesus is coming back. And most of the world, and uh, not just lost people, I believe most of the world, even church people, are not ready for that. You know, I think a lot of us have become comfortable and satisfied with just where we are. You know, we're satisfied where we are spiritually, and we don't even try or make any effort to get any closer to God, to go the next step in our faith walk. And uh, I don't know, a lot of you older people will know what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of the young people haven't been around long enough to notice it, but I grew up around here, and uh, there's a lot of older churches, and you know, they still look the same today that they looked 40 years ago. They've never had a building project. They've never expanded. They've never got any bigger at all. I've watched some of those churches. You know, they've had quite a few people in them when I was young. And uh, one church in particular that I know about, the last time I was over there, I think they had four people going to it. And that, to me, is sad. You know, they didn't want to get out of their comfort zone. They didn't want to grow in their faith. Uh, they didn't want youth groups. They didn't want all these things. They just wanted a comfortable place to go and meet, and that was it. And uh, so those churches are just dying. They're not growing. You know, God's Word says His kingdom never ends. The church should always be expanding. It should always be growing. It should always include children and youth and programs to help people mature in their faith. But when we get complacent <coughs> spiritually, then we don't even try to put any effort in to grow in our faith anymore. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 24, this is what I think about every time I think about somebody being complacent in their faith. It says, A slothful man hides his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. You know, it's, I think that's a lot of Christians are today. They came to God and tasted that God is good, but then they got comfortable where they are, and they won't even lift their hand to get another, another bite of God, another taste of God, and move forward in their faith. Uh, the first definition I want to share with you on uh, complacency came out of Wiktionary, and uh, that definition goes like this. Passivity as a result of contentment with the current situation, and I believe that's where a lot of Christians are. We get passive in our faith. We don't put any more effort into it because we're happy and content just being right here where we're at, not serving, not doing anything, just come to church, watch the sermon, go back out the doors, and uh, don't make any changes. And that's where a lot of people are. You know, I watch a lot of sermons online and stuff, and I pay attention to the, not just the preacher, but the way people are in church. You know, most of them are not serving. They're not doing anything. They just come in just in time, you know, most of the time during the worship service, find a seat, don't talk to anybody, and as soon as the service is over, they get up and leave before they have to talk to anybody. And that's not the way God designed his kingdom to be. He didn't... Uh, created us to be passive. He grew up. He created us to grow in our knowledge of Him and to serve Him and to serve His people. Uh, but what happens is God gets us out of our troubles into a comfort, a comfortable place, and we do become passive. And then we're no longer seeking God because we don't think we need His help anymore. 
we think just showing up for a service is, is all God requires of us. Uh, the second definition I want to share is from the Cambridge Dictionary. And it goes like this. It says, it's a feeling of calm satisfaction with your own abilities or situation that prevents you from trying any harder. So like I said, once God has helped us out of our troubles, we think, thanks for the help, God, but I've got it from here. You know, we go, and we go from that point, once we get there, with no eternity on our mind at all. You know, we're just satisfied to be in a soft spot, in our comfort zone. And that's a, like I said, God didn't call us to get comfortable here. He called us to get ready for Christ's return and to help other people to get ready for Christ's return. And uh, we get so focused on what pleases us, what makes us comfortable, that getting ready to meet Jesus just isn't on our schedule. You know, it's not on our radar. We don't have time for that. When we get to the place where all we're worried about is our comfort zone and uh, what pleases us, then we won't have a God in our schedule. We won't make time for that. Everything is going to be filled up with what pleases me, what I want, what's going to fulfill my desires. Uh, I do a Bible study on Monday nights, and uh, we listen to a sermon by Levi Lusco Monday night, and I want to share one statement he made in that. It really stuck in my head when I heard it. He said, don't let earth keep you from heaven. You know, don't let earth keep you from the kingdom of God. And I like that. You know, there's nothing on this earth that is going to last. So we, there's nothing on this earth that is worth keeping us from heaven, keeping us from the kingdom of God. So don't get so busy and caught up in earthly things that you don't have time for God. You know, we, I, I think a lot of us get in the mindset of, you know, I can't read my Bible right now because my favorite TV show's on. So I'll, I'll stare at the TV for a couple hours at something that isn't even real. It's something that somebody made up just for entertainment. And then by that time, I'm too tired to read my Bible now. I'll read it in the morning when I first get up. You know, does that sound familiar to anybody? I mean, I can remember the days when I was like that. You know, I'll read my Bible later. I really like this show, so I'll just... I'll read my Bible in the morning. And then when morning gets there, well, i got to watch the news first and because if I don't, I'll miss the news. So I need to watch that first. Then I'll read my Bible. And then when the news goes off, and then we're like, oh, look at the time. Now I don't have time to read my Bible. i got to get to work or i got to go to school or i got a doctor's appointment. And God's Word just sits there, you know, it, getting dust on it. I like the way Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So we're filling up our schedule with things that are going to pass away, and we're leaving the one thing <coughs> that is eternal, that will last forever, just sitting there. You know, all those things that keep you busy or distract you, are going to pass away, and God's Word is still going to be there. Complacency is just a trick of the enemy to deceive us and distract us into believing that we're okay when we're not okay. He don't want us to be aware of the danger of not being ready for Christ's return. And uh, that's all complacency is. He gets us to a point of, if I can just get them more concerned about pleasing themselves than they are pleasing God, that's all complacency is. And that's a trick of the enemy to distract us from living the life that we should be living for God. Uh, I'll read you another definition. This one's from dictionary.com. It says complacency is a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, false security, often unaware of potential danger or personal defects, or the like. Uh, when we become complacent, we shield ourselves from seeing the truth. Like I said, the only thing we're worried about is what pleases us and fulfilling our own desires. So we shield ourselves so we don't have to face that, and we get ourselves in our own little bubble, and we don't want to think about the danger of not being right with God. We just want to fantasize about everything's just fine. So we blind ourselves 
to not see the importance of our relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> you know, like we just read in that definition, we just want to hide ourselves in a false sense of security, thinking that things are okay right now, and they're going to stay that way. You know, nothing's ever going to go wrong. And uh, But that's not true. Things will not stay that way, and things do go wrong. Jesus himself said that. Uh, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might have trouble. He said you will have trouble. Uh, in First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it talks about our enemy. He tells us again to be sober, be vigilant. You know, don't be complacent. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So we have an enemy, and he's out to get us. You know, we have to be sober and vigilant and not be complacent. Uh, the next definition, and this one comes out of Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it says complacency is a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. You know, that's a secular definition, and it sounds to me like it came straight out of the Bible. You know, when we become complacent, we become smug. Uh, we become uncritical of ourselves. And uh, to me, that sounds a whole lot like self-righteousness. You know, if we're not critical of ourselves and we're smug, that's being prideful. We become self-righteous and smug. We start thinking that we've got it all together, and we become uncritical of ourselves. We start, you know, accepting ourselves no matter what state we're in. But we become more critical and more judgmental of other people because we have such a high view of ourselves that anybody that's not like us, uh, we're going to judge them for it. And uh, we'll start judging people by the way we live instead of by God's Word. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know, we're not supposed to put ourselves above anybody. We're supposed to be obedient to God and not critical and judgmental of others. We talk about that a lot in here. So when we get to that point, we're going to be critical of other people, but we no longer see the need for change in our own lives because we're already comfortable and satisfied with the way we are. And when we get there, then we will start avoiding God's Word, and we'll start avoiding God's people because it shines a light on what we know in our hearts isn't right. You know, we don't want people telling us, hey, I'm worried about you. You know, you're not, you didn't used to be that way. I think you might be slipping a little bit. We don't want to hear that. You know, we know in our hearts it's not right, but we've got complacent and we don't care anymore. We're satisfied with it anyway, even though we know it's not right. Uh, we no longer desire to change and become what God wants us to be. We've gone right back to where we started before we came to Christ, and that's to pleasing ourselves and fulfilling our own desires. So complacency will lead to self-righteousness. Uh, when we become complacent or passive like that, we also become spiritually lazy. Like I said earlier, we don't put the importance on being obedient to God that we used to. We don't put urgency on doing things God asked us to do. We start putting things off and making other things more important than what God is saying. Uh, when we get to that point, we don't put any more importance or urgency on what God asked us to do than we do the dirty dishes. You know, we look at them sometimes and say, I'll just do those later. Or, you know, washing our laundry or something like that. I'll just wash those later. I don't feel like it right now. And we just keep putting it off and putting it off until it just piles up to the point where we're like, okay, you know, now I don't want to do it at all. It's piled up so much. It's too overwhelming. Now I just don't even want to do it. And if we start put, putting off what God is telling us to do, then that happens to us spiritually too. We'll get so far away from God that we, we'll give up. We'll be like, well, I'm this far gone. It's no point in trying no, anymore. I'm just going to stay right where I'm at. And uh, that's not what God wants us to do. You know, just like the dishes and just like the laundry, we'll get to the point where we're just like, I'm just going to ignore it and act like it's not there. And uh, that's what we do with our Bibles. When we start feeling condemnation, condemnation hurts. And uh, to avoid the pain, 
We just won't read it at all because every time I pick it up, every time I read it, it makes me feel bad. And the only reason it makes us feel bad is because we know in our hearts we've become complacent and passive and we're not being obedient to it. And that is dangerous. Uh, this is the last definition I want to share with you. Like I said before, all these definitions are secular definitions. They're not from the Bible. They're not from the strong concordance. But almost all of them point to the fact that complacency blinds us to a danger that is coming. Uh, you know, that's inevitable. And we're oblivious to it. We're blinded to it. This comes from Oxford Languages. And this definition says... A self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by an unawareness of actual danger or deficiencies in ourselves. Like I said, those are secular definitions. And to me, that's a lot like God is saying, hey, don't get complacent. That's a trick from the enemy. Wake up. You know, he's blinding you to the truth. He don't want you to see that you're in danger. And uh, that's the number one trick Satan's been using ever since the beginning of time. He tricks us into thinking we're okay when we're not. And the complacency will get us there. You know, you're not going to be okay if you believe being comfortable in this world is all that matters. You know, all through Scripture, the Bible is telling us that this world will pass away. We just got through reading the verse in Matthew 24 and verse 35 where Jesus said, you know, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. We can't put our faith in anything this world has to offer. I want to share just a, a few verses with you real quick, and there's a lot more than these, but I just picked a few just for, to be an example of how the Bible just repeats itself over and over and over that this world will pass away. First uh, John 2 and verse 17. It says, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, all the things that we're putting our faith in and, you know, making ourselves comfortable with, they're going to pass away. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Mark thirteen thirty one. It says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Jesus says that three times in three different gospels. Luke 21, verse 33, says the same thing. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. <coughs> the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Uh, Revelations 21 and verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And that's just a few of the verses. The Bible is full of verses telling us this world will pass away. So we can't get complacent in our faith. We can't get comfortable in the things this world has to offer. And uh, it seems like that's all people are chasing. There's more money, a bigger house. You know, a better car, all these things. And there's nothing wrong with having a nice car. There's nothing wrong with having a nice home. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But if our relationship is not right with God, that has to be number one. We need to get that secured and keep it secure. Because this world cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And... Uh, <coughs> And talking about that, the Bible is also full of warnings to get prepared for the coming of Jesus. You know, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We just read in Second Peter that he's going to be like a thief in the night. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. Nobody knows that. But we do know he's coming. And that's a reality for all of us. You know, that's a reality for me. That's a reality for you, for your co-workers, for your children, for your grandchildren. We have to put God first. You know, like Levi Lesko said, don't let earth keep you from heaven. There's nothing here worth that. When we stand before Christ, <clears throat> none of the things that we put so much value on are going to matter. You know, our bank accounts, our homes. Uh, a big thing I see that deceives a lot of people is sports. There's nothing wrong with sports. 
but I see all kinds of people all the time. Well, I can't make it to church. We've got a game. I got. To, we can't make it to church. We have a practice. We put more value on sports than we do on our eternal life, and that is a trick of the enemy. I wish people could see. And uh, you know, I'm not up here trying to make anybody mad or trying to put anybody down. I'm trying to help you understand the truth of the matter that when you stand before Christ, he's not going to care whether or not you made it to the practice. He's not going to care who won this game and won that game. He's going to matter when we stand before God is whether we know Jesus Christ and whether our name (coughs) is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We talked about that a little bit last week too. You know, I don't want to stand before Christ and tell him I would have been there or I would have done this or that but there was a ball game or American Idol was on TV. You know, if you really believe in God, if you really want to go to heaven, then we have to live like it. You know, that has to be the top of our priorities and not get comfortable and complacent where we are. we got to do like it says in Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> in verse 33, it says, But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, And then all these things will be added unto you. You know, I've learned in my life, if I put God first, He's not going to take away things you enjoy. He's going to give you more things that you enjoy. You're not going to miss out on anything. But He says, seek Him first in the kingdom of God because He cares about us. I don't know how many of y'all remember the, the sermon I did probably about a year ago about Dying and perishing. He don't want any of us to perish. It says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's not trying to get you to miss out on anything in life. He wants you to get your relationship with him secured so you can enjoy life without fear of death. And then you don't have to hide from him anymore. You can enjoy life without that hanging over your head. But we have to get that taken care of and established first. If not, then we'll just go through the rest of our life deceiving ourselves in complacency. And when we do stand before Christ, then what do we do then? You know, you're, you're going to wish you would have. You know, if you really love your family and want them to go to heaven too, don't just meet your desires and do everything they ask you to do. Do like it says right there in that verse and seek God first. And be obedient to God and lead them to Him. And, you know, even if you were able to give them the whole world, where does that lead them when Christ comes back? You know, if you're able to give them anything they desire, meet their every need, what what good does that do them when Christ comes back? Jesus Himself said in Matthew 16 and verse 26, He said, For what it Is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing we can give in exchange for our soul. And what does it profit us to gain the whole world? So nothing this world has to offer can save you or your family. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ can do that. And, uh, you know, we can't leave eternal decisions to our children. You know, they don't have any idea of what's right and wrong. They don't know what's going to lead them to destruction in the end. They have no understanding of eternal life. We have to teach them that and, and not leave the choice up to them to make whether or not we're going to church or we're not watching. You know, we need to be the ones to tell them we're not watching that show or we're not watching this show. And we need to explain to them why. You know, they need direction. They need guidance. Children need to be told what to do and what not to do. You know, kids want us to tell them what to do. They don't know what to do on their own. You know, I see kids all the time going in the wrong direction, and they have no idea they're going in the wrong direction because nobody's told them. You know, once you tell them, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, then they know, hey, I shouldn't be doing that. Kids not only need direction and need guidance they want it you know i see a lot of kids that just wish they had somebody to show them how to do things they're not doing them wrong on purpose they're doing them wrong because they don't know how to do them right you know that's why we have ministries like koz and stuff like that 
It's good for kids to learn how to do things. But it's our responsibility uh, as the adults to show them how to do those things. They don't know how to do those things on their own. But the best thing you can do for your children is to live for God yourself. You know, model it for them. Be an example for them. You know, don't be complacent in your own faith and then expect them to be strong in theirs. Because most of the time, what I'm doing, my kids are going to follow me. I remember back when I was uh, still in my alcoholic years, you know, what did my daughter do? She started becoming an alcoholic. But when I gave my life to Christ and started living for him, I thank God for this. Now she lives her life for him. She no longer drinks. She no longer does any of that stuff. She's a good, godly woman. But I often wonder what would have happened if I wouldn't have came to Christ. You know, maybe I would have destroyed the rest of her life too. But uh, I thank God every day that did not happen. Uh, how many of y'all know what a totem pole is? If you've ever seen them, you know, they've got faces all the way down to the bottom in order of importance, you know. And uh, that's kind of like getting our priorities in order. You know, the most important thing at the top, and then the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. And, uh, you know, our kids' totem pole is going to look a lot like our totem pole. You know, we can't expect them to have God <coughs> on the top of theirs and be good and be obedient to God when Jesus is at the bottom of our pole uh, getting crushed by all the things that come before him. You know, things that we consider more important than Jesus. And that, I know that's, that's pretty hard stuff, ain't it? It's hard on me too. But uh, we have to ask ourselves that. You know, where in my life am I becoming complacent? What is becoming more important to me than my relationship with Christ? You know, where am I satisfied that I know I shouldn't be? But it's just been that way so long, it don't bother me anymore. You know, those are real questions we got to ask ourselves. And I think a lot of us are in that boat. You know, there are just things in our life that has been that way so long, I forgot. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I've just got used to it. And I, I gave up on trying to change it years ago. Because it's been that way that long, then I've got it in my mind that it's okay that way now. And, uh, you know, when we take a good long look at it, we realize it's not okay that way. I just gave up. And uh, that's called complacency. And just because it don't bother us anymore, just because it's been there so long that we have gotten used to it, it still bothers God. Or he wouldn't have brought it to your attention in the first place. You know, what? what is that thing that God asked you to do that still just sitting there gathering dust just like our Bibles I talked about a while ago you know God's still waiting on us to do that uh, maybe you're wondering why God quit moving in your life well maybe he's just waiting on you to do the last thing he asked you to do that you just keep ignoring because you don't want to do it and I spent a lot of time in my life right there you know God said you need to do this or you need to do that and uh I wasn't willing to do it. I wasn't willing to make the change. I had got comfortable where I was, and uh, I started making the rules myself again. It's okay. It don't bother me. So I'm all right with it. I'm not going to change it. That's not what God wants from us. God wants us to be obedient. And, uh, you know, I noticed God quit moving in my life, and uh, that was why, because I wasn't doing the things that he already told me I needed to do. And I recognized that, and when I did make those changes and actually do the things God asked me to do, then I started noticing He showed me the next step and the next step and the next step. But if we just stop and stop doing the things that God's asking us to do, He's not going to show us the next step until we take the one we have right in front of us. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 7 and verse 23 uh, there's nothing on this earth worth hearing this. And this is Jesus talking. He said, and then, well, I profess unto them, I never knew you.
depart from me, you that work iniquity. You know, I've told you a bunch of times that that verse gives me cold chills. I don't want to hear that, and I hope none of you ever hear that either. Uh, we will all stand before God one day, so let's stop being complacent and live like it. Uh, believe it in our hearts that one day this life will be over and I will give an account for it. So we can't be complacent. We have to live what we believe. If we believe we will stand before God, then we need to get our relationship with Him right. I know that's hard. And it's not easy to get up here and preach. <coughs> But that is the truth, and uh, I, <clears throat> I love you guys enough to tell you the truth. You know, I don't want you to hear those words. I want you to hear the words in Matthew 25 and verse 21. It says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. And I know you'd rather hear those words too. So, uh, you know, let's take a good look at ourselves. Let's not be complacent in our faith. Let's be obedient. Let's not be made. Let's not be lazy. You know, let's make the changes that God is asking us to make. You know, Jesus is coming back. So let's get let's get ready for him and stop putting it off. Like we said earlier, you know, nobody has a clue when he's coming. But we know for a fact he is coming if we're truly believing in God and what his word says. You know, whether we die first or Jesus Christ returns, we're going to stand before God. And living in complacency is not going to be good for us. You know, if we have to meet him today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You know, we can't do it yesterday and uh, we're not promised tomorrow. Today is the only day we have a choice to do anything. So... You know, let's get ready, and then, then let's stay ready. You know, live daily for God. One thing I love about uh, the 12 steps of recovery, you know, the 10th step is a do a daily inventory of yourself. You know, go back over my day, and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. And, uh, you know, that's how our prayer life should look like at the end of the day. You know, I need to review my day and if I messed up that day, you know, don't just brush it off and be like, well, I'll do better tomorrow. No, that's how complacency starts. You know, if I messed up today, I need to take it to God and say, Lord, I, I messed up today. I need you to forgive me for this or for that and then do better tomorrow. But, uh, you know, we have to confess our sins to ourselves uh, and to God. And that's the only way we'll make a difference. If we start getting complacent, then sooner or later we'll start being okay with that. And then we'll be like, that's eh, just the way it is. Just like the laundry and just like the dishes, it'll build up until we got a mess we don't want to deal with. So we got to stick with it every day and do that, you know, do that daily inventory. But uh, that's my message for tonight. I hope that helps somebody. I really do. I hope that wakes somebody up and it helps you to get back in your faith. It's really easy to get complacent. It's really easy to get comfortable and get lazy. You know, we're fixing to go to two services. That's going to require a whole lot more service. It's going to require a whole lot more of being committed to what God has called us to. He didn't call us to be lazy. He didn't call us to become like all those old churches I was talking about before that just dwindle away until they die. You know, that don't show this world the power of God at all. That shows how weak, you know, some people's Christian faith is. And uh, I think the world looks at the Christian faith today as all of us are lazy and weak and complacent and don't believe the things that we preach. You know, the world looks at us as hypocrites, as all kinds of things, because they don't see people practicing what they preach. So I... I pray that, you know, if you do see complacency in your life, that you will deal with it. Uh, ask God to help you, and he will. You know, I've noticed some places in my life where I've been complacent, and God revealed them to me. Like I said, when we get in his word or get around his people, it shines a light on what we need to work on. And uh, it's not just knowing 
what we need to work on. It's actually, you know, working on it. Make the changes. Do the things that we need to do. But, like I try to tell you every week, if you never surrendered your life to Christ, then that's that's where it has to start. And the only two people that know that, whether you are surrendered to Christ or not, are you and the Lord. So if you're watching online and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I'd like to give you that opportunity. And it's really simple. Uh, just tell God, I'm a sinner. I know I need to get my relationship with you right. And ask him to come into your heart and save you, and he will. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, it really is that simple. It says in verse 9, If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. In verse 10 says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So that's saying, just believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins, and he rose from the dead. And uh, then confess with your mouth. Tell somebody, I've gave my life to Christ, and you shall be saved. But that confession is important. You know, don't just keep it to yourself and think, well, I'm okay. The Bible is clear. You know, tell somebody, I've gave my life to Christ. And then it says, and that makes it unto salvation. And don't let nobody tell you you've gone too far or you're too, too messed up to be saved because verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 8, it says, But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So don't let people tell you you've got to get cleaned up and get it all together and then come to church and you'll be accepted. God will accept you right where you are. It says that's why he died for us, because we are sinners. He died for us while we were sinners sinners so Christ has already died for you he knows all about your sins he just wants you to come to him surrender your will to his and uh, ask him to be your Lord and he will do it he did it for us he'll do it for you and if you've done that today and you don't go to church anywhere uh, you can call us here Uh, there'll always be somebody glad to talk to you and tell you what the next step is or you're welcome to come here in person and talk to somebody. We'll be glad to do that, too. But that's my message for tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out. And thank you for tuning in. If you're watching online, let me pray for us, and we will be dismissed. Father, I thank you for this message. I just thank you, Lord, for uh, helping me get up here and preach tonight. And Lord, I just thank you for the areas of my life that you showed me I've been getting complacent and uh Thank you for the direction and the guidance that you gave me. Lord, I pray that for every person here tonight, every person that's watching online, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to make an an honest evaluation of ourselves, Lord, and to bring that before you and ask you for your help with it. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be obedient to the things you tell us to do with it. Help us to make the changes, Lord, and to put forth the effort that we need to put forth so that we can bear the fruit you want us to bear, Lord, and become the body of Christ that you want us to be, the men and women of God that you want us to be. Help us to be the parents, Lord, that we need to be, and the friends and the co-workers, and help us to just be the Christians that we need to be in every every area of our life, Lord. And I just pray that that brings you glory. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name I do pray. Amen.